Castle, episode 555 for January 1st, 2019. Candied Sweets, Cornbread, and Black-Eyed Peas by Malon Edwards. Rated PG-13. And welcome to Podcastle. I'm Aidan Doyle, one of your associate editors. I'm also one of the co-editors, along with E. Catherine Tobler and Rachel K. Jones, of Sword and Sonnet, an anthology of 23 fantasy and science fiction stories featuring battle poets. Many of the writers in the anthology will be familiar to Podcastle listeners. Sword and Sonnet is available on Amazon and other online retailers. Today's story Candied Sweets, Cornbread and Black-Eyed Peas by Malin Edwards was originally published in Sword and Sonnet in 2018. When Elise, Rachel and I were thinking about authors who we wanted to include in the anthology, Malin was one of the first names that sprang to mind. His Half Dark Promise, which features the same character as today's story, is such a beautiful lyrical story. Check the show notes for links to Malin's other podcastle stories. Malin Edwards was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, but now lives in the greater Toronto area, where he was lured by his beautiful Canadian wife. Many of his short stories are set in an alternate Chicago and feature people of colour. Malin serves as Grants Administrator for the Speculative Literature Foundation, which provides a number of grants for writers of speculative literature. Your reader today is Mandali Louise Schall. Mandali has been running the Haitian Creole blog for five years now, and is an advocate for the Creole language. The blog promotes the Haitian Creole language to foreigners and natives. The blog's Twitter page, Creole Lingo, publishes daily Haitian Creole words and terms for natives and foreigners. Mandali just completed a project creating the first ever Creole alphabet song and animated video for the Creole language, as the alphabet is unknown to most Haitians at this time. This successful project was done in collaboration with MIT linguistic professor Michelle DeGraff. Now grab your machete and get ready for some oh-so-beautiful writing. Candied Sweets, Cornbread, and Black Eyed Peas by Malon Edwards. Narrated by Mandali louis No one wanted to come out of their houses. Not at first. They could see my father's blood soaking the cobblestones. They could see it dripping from the machete in my hand. They didn't want to come bab to bab, face to face, with Grand Diabla, the wicked little girl who had just disemboweled her own father. I wouldn't either if I were them. Vraiment vrai, I'm not really the great devil child. C'est pour tout bon, oui. If I'm lying, I'm dying. I just swing my machete like her. These people knew that. I had lived on Oglesby Avenue next to them for the last three years since I was eight years old. Since Papa and I followed Mommy here to La Petite Haiti in Chicago. Since Papa and I no longer called La Petite Haiti in Miami home. I had been nothing but kind to them. I had been nothing but polite to them. I had been nothing but respectful to them. My mama raised me right. But even that didn't make them come out of their houses. I could understand if Papa had been out there wearing the softening shadows of the fading half-dark, long, sharp, hungry teeth slobbering all over the place. I could even understand if Papa was still lying in the street Me standing over him, guts steaming on the cobblestone, blood searching for the gutters. But the half-dark had lifted. The sackman, Papa Moy, my wonderful and horrible father, eater of children, was gone. All that was left was me. All that was left was Ephraim. I saw what I did. I was there when I did it. I'd be afraid of me too. I was scarier than the shadow man, even though he had stalked Timonio in the half-dark on the way home from school. I was scarier than the sack man, even though he had snatched Timonio into his gunny sack 
just steps from their front doors. I would be placed the nightmares of all the Timunyo on the street. Instead of having terrible dreams about the sack man or the shadow man stalking and eating them, they would have terrible dreams of me standing over my father, Tonto Makut in hand. They would tell their friends on Yates Avenue about their terrible dreams, and those friends would tell their friends on Bensley, and those friends would tell their friends on Calhoun, and those friends would tell their friends on Hoxie. And I would become a Lugau, the boogeyman, the monster in the closet hiding behind the clothes, the monster under the bed ready to grab feet and ankles. I didn't like that. I had to change that. The first person who came out of their house was a little girl. She didn't see me as a Lugau. She didn't see me as the boogeyman. She didn't see me as the monster in the closet or the monster under the bed. En effet, she saw herself in me. She was about three and a half years old, maybe four. Tifiate Adorab. She had afro puffs, just like mine. She walked over to me. She took my right hand. She looked up at me. She had to crane her neck way back. I must have looked like a grown-up to her, even though I was only 11 and three quarters years old. I was taller than all of the girls and most of the boys in my Covey 4 class back then. I am taller than all of the girls and all of the boys in my Covey 4 class now. Kino, she asked me. Mikael Isabel, I told her. Moi, t'étendé palé de où? She had told me. She had said this with a sing-son lilt in her voice and a lovely smile, as if what she'd heard about me was a secret. With my left hand, I slipped Tonto Makut, my machete, behind my head into its sheath, sewn onto the outside of my backpack, and crouched down. I wanted to look directement into this little girl's big, beautiful, dark brown eyes. What did you hear about me? I asked her. I couldn't help but smile as I did. She was all kinds of precious. I heard you sent away the half dark. Foisa, li allez pour tout bon, pour tout temps. Forever, hm? I asked her. My tone was playful. It held a hint of a tease, but only a hint. This little girl was shrewd, perceptive, discerning. She had to be. She was out here, all alone, with me, without her parents. She would have known if I was talking down to her. She would have known if I was dismissing her tiny convictions. Oui, she had answered, and her smile was so lovely that I wanted to bite her baby fat cheeks and eat her dimples. Maybe that was the papa part of me. He was the sack man à la fin, and the shadow man, vraiment vrai. But we're not talking about the low-down, dirty, no-good snake right now. Les bombes qui sont on my way home from school today. I thought I was going to die from fright. Right here, right on this street, right in the half-dark. I won't forget that. I'm still mad at him for that. Who told you that? I asked her. Mama mwe ak papa mwe, the little girl pointed to her house two doors down. The curtains in the front window twitched. Mugen raison. I calmed the half dark. I sent her away. Will she come back? The little girl asked me. I didn't answer her. That wasn't my answer to give. More people came out of their houses when they saw the little girl's mama ak papa sweep her up in their arms and plant kisses on her baby fat cheeks. I suppose her mama and papa were relieved I didn't slice their little girl in half with Tonto Makut. They knew I could. My father's blood was still on the cobblestones, trickling into the gutter. It was awkward. I gave them some space to let them have their moment. As they cuddled and kissed and smushed their adorable little girl, I just stood there shifting from foot to foot, their display of love and joy and care content went on for some time. They were heart happy. I didn't want to interrupt that. 
I didn't want to spoil that. But I had to go. I had to find Mama Moe. She had taken Papa Moe somewhere to hide him, to heal him, to let him start again in another part of this city where the pickings were right for the eater of children. It was what he did. It was what she did. I didn't know where they were, but I knew he was still alive. I could feel it. I had to do something about it. As I turned to leave, the little girl's mother pulled me to her. Her arms were muscular. Her embrace was warm. Her words were needed. Messy, she told me. I could feel her tears on my cheek. Messy en pile. Pas de quoi, I whispered. The little girl's mother could feel my tears on her cheek. I couldn't remember the last time my mother hugged me. I couldn't remember the last time any mother hugged me. I couldn't remember the last time any woman hugged me. The little girl shifted on her mother's hip, leaned across her, and hugged my neck with her skinny little arms. Messy, messy, she told me. She could feel my tears on her baby fat cheek. It was so soft. It was so pliant. It was so close. I really did want to eat her dimples. But instead, I laughed. I couldn't remember the last time I laughed. Qui non ou tibubu? I asked her. Mwerele Mikael Annabelle, she told me, chin raised. I wanted to tell her that was a beautiful name for a beautiful little girl. But more people had come out of their houses. They came over to us. Some of the women gave me hugs. They could see I needed them. They could see I wanted them. Some of the women pressed sweet meats wrapped in wax paper into my hands. They could see I needed them. They could see I wanted them. Sugar plums, sugar-coated almonds, peanut brittle, pain patate. Some of the men pressed my hands with both of theirs. Large, gnarled knuckles, ashy but gentle. They introduced me to their daughters and their heirloom machetes they had just given their tifichiri. Until they could commission new, shiny, custom-made ones from the blacksmith. Their names were Carmelite and La Verite, Nadej and Nadio, Tia and Tifiette, Zet and Timize. None of those machetes was as special as Tontomakut, except for maybe Timize. There is nothing wrong with giving a little misery by blade to the shadow man, the sack man, the pogo, or whatever else is lurking in the dark on the streets of Chicago. I didn't notice the food, not at first. There were so many people who wanted to thank me and tell me how I inspired their daughters that five of the wooden picnic tables had already been set up in the middle of the street before I realized what was going on. They were having an impromptu block party. I wasn't all that surprised. I had just banished the half-dark from the south side of Chicago. People wanted to celebrate. People wanted to eat. People wanted to dance to music in the street under the night sky as the gas lamps kept the full dark at bay and our fears in check. We hadn't done that since old Heck was a pup and now he's a grown dog, as Mama Mwe would say. Child, you sound more and more like your mama every day. I hadn't realized I said that out loud. You sure is right, Miss Elaine, and she looked just like her daddy with them Deveno eyes. All his people got them. You ain't never lie, Miss Irene, and look how tall she is now. She got that height from her mama. And her daddy, Miss Savannah May. Don't forget about that tall drink of dark water. Miss Irene shook her smooth dark bald head. Girl, you better shut your mouth talking like that in front of children. Miss Savannah May kissed her teeth. <sniffs> Listen to Miss Elaine talking about this child's daddy like she just came to town, thirsty as all get out. Cause it's a ten mile walk on a dusty dirt road between here and the next town over where them nice Christian went her out with only a church lady hat and a burlap suitcase to her name. Miss Elaine kissed her teeth back at Miss Savannah May. 
It ain't like you both wasn't thinking the same thing. Miss Savannah May leaned over to Miss Irene and stage whispered, That fast girl over there need to get back to church and get right with God. Miss Irene raised her hand, closed her eyes, and bowed her head as if she were in church and the Sunday morning service was just getting good. Preach, Sister Reverend, same this hidden heifer. Nah, Miss Savannah May, Miss Elaine began, we three know the moment any of us walk into a church, God gonna strike us down dead on the spot for our sins of gossip and lust. Miss Irene finished, and all three women cackled like that was the funniest joke in the world. I looked at all three women for a moment each, with their smooth, dark, beautiful skin and their smooth, dark, beautiful, bald heads. I frowned. Who are you? I asked them. Who do you think we are? Miss Irene asked me, wiping her tears from laughing so hard. My brow furrowed. My frown deepened. You seem very familiar to me, but I can't place you. None of you. Child, you better eat before this good food get cold, Miss Elaine told me. Miss Savannah May took me by the elbow and led me over to six picnic tables pushed together end to end, covered with red and white checked tablecloths. Look at this here spread. Macaroni and cheese, glazed ham, coleslaw, collard greens, I ate mine with candied sweets, which over there. Cornbread, I made it myself. Black eyed peas, chitlins, the hot sauce over there. Mashed potato and gravy. And then, child, Miss Elaine said at my other elbow, when you're ready, you can have some dessert. Peach cobbler, sweet potato pie. I'm not a child. Everything stopped. Everything except the music. No one moved. No one spoke. Everyone just looked at me. It was the longest ten seconds of my life. Let me fix you a plate, Shushumwe, Miss Irene said finally, and grabbed a heavy-duty paper plate that could withstand all of that cupid wet food. Everyone started eating and talking again. Listen, Miss Irene said as she scooped food onto the plate for me. We know you ain't a child no more. Not after the way you sliced the pogo's face and that Bobby Bright Smith tentacle right off it. Who we know you hiding in your backpack right now so he won't scare all these nice people back into their houses. And, Miss Savannah May cut in, we know you ain't a child no more after just seeing you slice your daddy belly open so he wouldn't eat you, his beautiful baby girl. So, Shushumwe, Miss Elaine said to me, we all the way there with you on that. Like the Bible say, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a woman, I put away childish things. We know you don't think like a child no more. And we know you don't speak like a child no more either. And that saddens us. Miss Irene looked around at everyone enjoying the food. All of us. As we sat down at the table with Mikael and Abel and her mama at Papa, I looked at Miss Irene and said, You still haven't told me who you are. Mikael and Abel smiled at me. I still wanted to eat her dimples. Miss Savannah May frowned. Not a deep one, not as a rebuke. Yonticus, just a little bit. We gonna tell you, Shushume, but we ain't got time for no questions. You gotta eat. You need your strength. I started with the macaroni and cheese. C'est des coupées wet. No, it was better than delicious. It was ambrosia. Miss Elaine started with the story. We, the three whispers, it's our business to know everybody's business. But don't take that the wrong way, Miss Irene continued. We nosy, but we are malicious. We ain't trying to do nobody bad. We just tell you what you need to know, when you need to know it. And, Miss Savannah May added, we tell you what you need to do, when you need to do it. Somehow, I knew Miss Irene and Miss Savannah May wasn't just talking about me, but 
the collective you, everyone on this block, everyone on the south side, everyone in the sovereign state of Chicago even. But how do you know what you need to tell me and what I need to do? I asked them. Miss Savannah May gave me the nicest cut eye I had ever seen. What we say about asking us question, Shushume. Her tone was soft, but her eyes weren't playful. She had been silly. Miss Elaine tutted Miss Savannah May. Leave her alone, sister whisper. Kaya just curious. Well, Kaya better keep eating, Miss Savannah May said, and crossed her long, dark, lovely arms. Cause she ain't got much time, and she gonna need her shrimp and to get here. She nodded at what little macaroni and cheese I had left. My fork paused in front of my open mouth. That's the second time one of you said that. And it gonna be the last time you hear anybody say anything at all if you keep talking and stop eating, Miss Elaine said. She watched me finish my macaroni and cheese, and then said, her voice soft and reverent, Belle Flair made us. Belle Flair is a myth, I said, moving on to my greens and candied sweets. Miss Savannah May kissed her teeth again. Tch! Girl, you better shut your mouth and stop talking that blasphemy. Belle Flair shaped us from her rich, dark, pure soil. Miss Irene smiled at me, a kind one, a respectful one. Belle Flair is very real. She rebuilt Chicago after the war Layer by layer, all with the purified soil from the coal dust boiler in her chest. She ain't telling no lies, Shushumwe, Miss Savannah May said. Belle fled and spread that rich dark soil on top of all the nuclear ash. And when it settled, when it wasn't going to blow away into Lake Michigan or Iowa, she put a bit of copper and uranium and gold and even diamond in every other precious metal she could think of far beneath that life-giving dirt surface. And from those metals, Miss Elaine said, her tone and eyes bright, she forged three steam-clocked hearts, very much like the one you have in your chest right now, and put them in our chest. Miss Irene finished the tale. But before she left Chicago to bring life back to the rest of this war-ravaged country, she shaped the clockmaker, taught him how to build steam clock hearts and clockwork machines, and then told him to populate Chicago again. I ate a fork full of black-eyed peas and a bite of Miss Savannah May's cornbread. It was fluffy. It was delicious. That's a fairy tale they told us in kindergarten. Miss Irene crossed her long, dark, lovely arms and rocked side to side. That's cause fairy tales the only way your young guns gonna remember your sculptural history. You ain't never lie, Miss Elaine said, and also crossed her long, dark, lovely arms and rocked side to side. Miss Savannah May leaned over toward me, put her mouth behind the back of her hand, and pretended to say under her breath, Unless Miss Savannah May lips are moving, or she complimenting you. All three women stopped talking. All three women looked at each other. No words were spoken. No cut eye was given. And then all three women cackled, loud, long, and lusty. Are you like the three fates or something? I asked them. Them heifers can't do what we do. Miss Savannah May shot back, and they all cackled again. Miss Irene put a saucer of peach cobbler in front of me. Eat up, baby girl. You almost finished, which is good. Them Koyamarans gonna be here soon. And they ain't no joke. You ain't say nothing but a word, Miss Elaine murmured. I ate a fork full of peach cobbler. It was good, sweet, and tart. But I wanted some more candied sweets. What's a Koyamarant? I asked Miss Elaine. The devil on a Sunday morning, she answered. Miss Irene had given me an explanation that made more sense. A sleek and powerful clockwork machine that's a hybrid of a coyote and a cormorant, built from some of those precious metals Bell Flair put in the ground. It even got wings. Your brother, the Pogo, convinced the clockmaker to build them. Convince my ass, 
Miss Savannah made kiss her teeth. That awful so-and-so brother of yours told the clockmaker if he built those coyamarants, then he'd gift him the sackman chewed up like a Thanksgiving turkey to do with whatever he wanted. And, of course, the clockmaker agreed, Miss Irene said, arms folded, rocking side to side again. The sackman ate the clockmaker churn just like he ate most of the churn in Chicago, both of them beautiful little girls. See? That's how you know them coyamarant nasty, Miss Savannah May said, her lips curled with loathing. That's how you know they vile. A grieving father made them with revenge and hatred and anger in his heart. So you gotta be ready. You gotta be strong. Them coyamarants gonna strike as soon as you make a mistake. And if you do, that gonna be your last one. Miss Elaine nudged Miss Savannah May with her elbow. Now, why you gonna say something like that? You want to scare this dear heart right before the biggest battle of her life? Mpape, I told Miss Elaine. We know you ain't, Shushume, Miss Irene said and patted my hand. Everything gonna be all right. That's why we here. But Miss Savannah May really isn't scaring me, I said, my voice firm. Sometimes when grown folk are talking, we young ones had to repeat ourselves to be heard. I sure hope not, Miss Savannah May said, cause they here. You didn't see them, not at first. No one did, not even me. We didn't see them because they had stalked us from the dark spaces between the houses. We didn't hear them because the piano and the trombones and the trumpets, the saxophones and the bass and the drums made their approach stealthy. We should have seen the glint of the gas lamps on their midnight blue metal skin. We should have heard their claws sparking on the cobblestones. But even if we did, we wouldn't have had enough time to run. You were the first person I thought of when I heard the screams. The musicians and the people dancing were the easiest targets. Joy had closed their eyes, spun their bodies, licked their fingers and freed their souls. Your mama snatched you as I stood. Your papa flipped the picnic table as I slid Tonto Mako out of his sheath. You were safe. For now. I had something between me and the Koyamarans. For now. But there were so many of them. They were sleek. They were powerful. They were fast. They were ruthless. People were dying all around me. People were running in every direction all around me. Even the three whispers. Your mama and papa ran straight to your house. I ran straight to the Koyamarans. Two of the Koyamarans had just knocked down the trumpet players. Their beaks were bloody. Their claws were bloody. I stepped into form of the iron butterfly, just as papa had taught me so long ago, and dropped four quick vicious chops onto the backs of both Koyamarans. Two sets of wings ten hold on the cobblestones. They had looked too frail for flight anyway. The two coyamarants snarled and whipped around at me, quick as snakes with a claw strike each. I was shocked by their speed. Even though the three whispers had warned me, I parried one strike and spun away from the other. My footwork was clumsy. I gasped when the second claw scored my left shoulder blade. I could feel the blood flowing down my back. Mikael and Abel gasps. I tried to put some distance between me and the two coyamarants and moved back. I stumbled. The cobblestones were très uneven there. One of the coyamarants pounced to take advantage, and I parried its claw and I fell onto my back. Mikael and Abel gasps again. My breath was knocked out of me. The coyamarant went over the top of me. Predisposition trained and stank from hours upon hours of working with Papa saved me. I deflected a rake of the coyamarant's claw with Tonton Makut positioned to protect my face and my neck and then kicked the machine off me with my preacher boots, the ones I'm wearing right now. Mikael and Abel looks down at my boots and then back up at my face. Her big, beautiful, dark brown eyes are wide. Her mouth is open in a small, silent O. 
My kick sent the coyote and went flying into the other one. Jagged shards of midnight blue metal went flying end over end in every direction from the crash of metal bodies. Both coyamarants struggled to move. Both coyamarants struggled to get up. Both coyamarants struggled come at me again. They wanted to rip my throat out of three long, sharp metal claws on their front paws, but they couldn't. Their sinuous, flexible spines, which gave them their speed and quickness, had been broken. The red lights in their eyes winked out. Yotimuri, truly dead. Whee! Mikael and Abel cheers. That gave me some time to get my wind back, but not much. Six of the conglomerates had seen what happened to their sisters. Their head crests flared from the sides of their faces when they looked at me. They were trying to intimidate me. It didn't work. They wanted to avenge their sister's death. I wasn't going to let them. I wanted to live. I got back on my feet and took a deep breath before I stepped into form of the rising butterfly. I wanted to be calm. I wanted to be swift. I wanted to match Vitesse avec Vitesse. The coyomerant sprinted towards me from across the street. I kept my form and calmly advanced. Tonton Makut raised to strike just before they reached me. Two broke off to flank me on each side. I slowed my advance. I stayed in form. This wasn't going to be facile. I struck first. The four coyomerants in front of me were surprised. I smiled. Three quick rising butterfly strikes separated three of the coyomerants' head from their bodies. The coyomerants were built by the clockmaker for speed and agility, not strength. Papa trained me for speed, but Papa also trained me for strength. I stepped into form of Queen Alexandra's bird wing and unleashed brutal savagery on the last coyomerant in front of me. It didn't stand a chance. It didn't look like a coyomerant when I was finished with it. In my peripheral vision, I could see the flanking coyomerant pounce. I stepped into form of the monarch. I needed the confidence from that form. This was going to hurt, and it did. The two coyomerants swiped and slashed and raked and sliced. I parried and deflected most of their blows, but not all of them. Their claws found my rib and my forearms and my thighs and my lower back, but I did not fall. I did not drop Tonto Makut. But I was getting tired. I knew I couldn't last much longer. Mikael and Abel's bottom lip quivers. Tears stand in her large, lovely dark brown eyes. So I stepped into form of the Viceroy. I fainted left and then right. Both coyomerants flinched back to avoid Tonto Makut. And P, with a smooth spin that flowed into form of the rising butterfly again, I sliced left and then right. Heads rolled. I could hardly catch my breath. My chest was heaving. I wanted to collapse. And when I saw that all of the adults had come back outside with their pipes and their hoes and their rakes and their machetes to help me fight the rest of the coyomerants, I did collapse. Mwete fatigue. And so are you, I say to Mikael and Abel, wiping the spilled tears from her baby fat cheeks and tucking the covers under her chin. She yawns. Tell me the story, encore, but this time all in Creole. Her voice is sleepy. Ah, oh, Tibubu, I have to go. I have to find Mama Moyak, Papa Moy. S'il vous plaît, Mikael Isabel, she begs. D'accord, but I will tell it in Creole at Anglais again, because Mama and Papa told me you need to practice your Anglais. Merci, Mikael Annabelle murmurs and takes my hand into hers. No one wanted to come out of their houses. Not at first. I start all over again, but I don't get any further than that because Mikael Annabelle is fast asleep. And welcome back. 
I simply adore the language in this story. I also love the sense of community that fills the story's world. Our hero is not alone. Here's what Malin has to say about the story. Mikhail Isabel, the heroine of my Half Dark series, The Half Dark Promise, Shadow Man, Sack Man, Half Dark, Half Light, and Candied Sweets, Cornbread, and Black Eyed Peas, and more stories to come, is based on my daughter who is strong-willed, feisty, adventurous, keen on new experiences, and when confronted, will step up to the challenge and fight back until the confrontation has been resolved. Her name is inspired by former Governor General of Canada, the Right Honourable Macal Jean. I thought her first name was the perfect name for a young Haitian girl living in an old history Haitian influenced Chicago, founded by Haitian trader Jean Baptiste Pointe de Sabor. I see candied sweets, cornbread, and black eyed peas as the midpoint in Macal Isabel's hero's journey, but not entirely in the Joseph Campbell sense of the concept. I used to play text based muds back in the day, mostly solo leveling. And after an intense battle where I'd nearly die, I'd go to an inn to rest up, eat, restock my food stores, and interact with some of the other players and their characters until the next battle. But this story is more than just resting up for the next battle. It's about a black community overcoming the fear of one of their own, and supporting her when she needs them most. It's about story, black older women, based on my mother and her sisters, passing on love and knowledge to a young black girl is quickly emerging as a leader, and it's about the camaraderie of sharing southern black food in a blend of a block party family reunion like atmosphere. I wanted to draw a straight line from my alt history Chicago to real time Chicago and show how a dangerous Chicago still has positive elements within it. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at Podcastle, our audio engineer Peter Beravash, assistant editor Setsu Uzume, co-editors Jen Albert and Khalida Muhammad Ali, along with our, all our amazing first readers, Crystal Claxton, Matt Dovey, Ebony Dunbar, Alora Gatz, Craig Jetson, Aron Jiwa, Devon Martin, Ace Ratcliffe, Orion Rodriguez, Julian Jabot, Julia Pat, Hamilton Perez, and Eleanor Wood. Thanks for letting us share another story with you. Be sure to share it with your friends, hit us up on social media, And if you'd like to show some extra love, head to patreon.com, EA Podcasts, for special events, bonus episodes, and podcastle appearances in the wild. We'll be back next week with another tale. See you then.